Hi, this is Lainey Cameron, and I am so excited and thrilled today that I am here with Camille DeMaio, who is one of my favorite historical fiction writers and a very beloved historical fiction women's fiction writer, uh, best-selling, award-winning. Thanks for joining us today, Camille. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Where are you joining us from? Where are you today? Uh, we, I'm joining you from Williamsburg, Virginia. So we've uh, been here for a few years. Great little town, lots full of history, great place for a historical fiction writer. And I know today we're going to talk a little bit about your latest one, The First Emma. I read the, the Goodreads reviews. I, I'm going to tell you a couple of highlights of what I read there. Oh, okay. Uh, people, are call, people are calling it captivating, intriguing, and memorable. A fantastic historical fiction book. And fabulous, another great story from Camille. Just highlights from different reviews. And I, I grabbed this one, which I thought was a, a lovely review, review from another of my favorites. In fact, I've got two of her books on the, on the bookshelf behind me here. Uh, Chanel said, a beautifully crafted portrait of an intriguing woman, Camille DeMaio at her finest, leaves the reader feeling wholly immersed. Historical fiction fans will love this one. I can't think of anything nicer to have someone say about my book. <laughs> I know, that's fantastic. And that's great because I've gotten a lot better about not reading my reviews. So if somebody else wants to tell me the good ones, that's great. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I was talking to uh, Camille Pebec again last week. And one of the questions I asked her was like, do you read your reviews? Uh, I used to read them all. I used to read them all. And um, then over time, I now just look at the percentages. I go, okay, 4.7 people. <laughs> That's where I'm at, 4.7 <laughs> out of 5. So that feels good. And so, um, you know, when I will read them is uh, when I'm writing and I'm in uh, writer's block and I just need a little boost to make it feel like this book is worth continuing with. I'll go read some of my four and five stars star reviews and go, okay, I could do this. Um, so tell me a little bit about this first Emma. Tell me a little bit more. What was her, what was the inspiration for the book? Where'd you get the idea? Well, interestingly, so the picture of me that you pulled up there um, on that first screen is taken at a place called Hotel Emma, and that is where I got my inspiration. So I am a fourth generation San Antonian Texan, and uh, I grew up in Denver, but we went to go visit San Antonio every year. And my dad loved doing a nostalgia tour to the Alamo every single, every single year. So we would drive down the highway and off to the right, there was this uh, beautiful old building that I knew to have been an old brewery, but it was uh, quite run down and vacant. And later I lived there as an adult for 16 years and that old part of town got revitalized and it became the best part of town. There was a farmer's market, boutiques, shops, restaurants. It was just amazing. And the, the brewery itself was still closed, but was being renovated. And on these black letters outside, it said Hotel Emma. So I went on opening day, having just great anticipation, and it blew me away. It naturally, as a writer, you ask questions. And I said, well, who is this Emma of Hotel Emma? Because this is an amazing place. So being somebody who has not done well at... Um, uh, elevator pitches and memorizing them. I'm going to just read you the little back of the book. And so this is the first Emma is inspired by the true story of Emma Kaler, whose tycoon husband Otto was killed in a crime of the century murder by one of his two mistresses, both also named Emma, and her unlikely rise as CEO of a brewing empire during Prohibition. When a, t a chance to tell her story to a young teetotaler arises, a tale unfolds of love, war, beer, and the power of women. So when I learned wow. Emma's story, I just said, this has to be a book. I, I think I read some of the reviews for calling it a little bit feminist as a book as well. Is that right? Uh, feminist in the sense that, you know, she was doing things in 1914 that women just were not doing. You know, I, I have three daughters. I have a son as well. Um, I believe very much in the capabilities of, of women. And I'm excited that we have opportunities in front of us now that we didn't before. But there were still women way before us doing amazing things. And many of their stories are lost to history. Um, I almost ditched this book because a lot of Emma's story is lost to history. And I didn't have quite enough to fill out full-fledged book, which we can talk about how I got there. But I realized that if we just let these stories go because we don't have enough to tell the whole story, we're going to lose them all together. So uh, I really did want to make sure that this inspiring story of quite a pioneer woman was was told and uh, I'm glad I've gotten a chance to do that. <laughs> so, so how did you do it? How do you approach it when you have like big gaps in the story like that? How do you decide what to keep, what to use from real life and like tell me more? 
Yes. Well, I, anybody who's read my books knows I care very, very much about historical accuracy, very much about it. And so I was excited to dig into Emma's story. And I just made the assumption that I would find things along the path, like journals or, you know, one generation later, maybe some eyewitnesses or something like that. So I just expected I would be able to fully tell Emma's story. And in fact, it ended up being quite the opposite of that. There were gaping holes. Um, the things I did know were quite amazing, though. I went to every length I could think of I'm pretty somebody called me a historical detective and kind of when I knew when to stop was that I went to the hotel and I visited with the hotel's historian and when we talked about Emma he said I think you're now the world's fo foremost ep um, expert on Emma Kaler because you know as much as I do and he should be the guy who knows everything so I really uh, was grateful for his time but it made me think wow I have to approach the story in a different way because there's not quite enough to make an entire book out of it but it's one of those things where, you know, when you reach a crossroads or something happens differently from how you would like it to, it ends up becoming a complete blessing. And the blessing is this, is that it forced me to consider a second character. So my other character is named Mabel. It's 1943. She's totally fictional. And she comes to write Emma's memoirs as Emma is dying in 1943. And what's great about this is that that era in World War II was a big chance for women who were taking over jobs that men had gone had left as they go off to war and i see that as a real turning point for women and so we've got this character who has been wounded by losing people in war her fiance breaks up for her she comes to san antonio this literally this open book wants to write the memoirs of this woman and seeing where Emma has been shows her where she can go. So all of us today can really identify with Mabel and I think it was a better book for it. And in fact, a lot of my readers in the reviews I have read have told me that how much they love Mabel. So I'm, uh, I'm really glad to have run into the roadblock because it created something even better. Well, is there anything you learned that you didn't include? Anything that you said like, wow, that's fascinating, but it doesn't belong in the book? In all of my prior four books, that is always the case because you run the risk of doing what's called an info dump and you as a geeky historian find all these things that you think would be fascinating to put in there. But as a historical fiction writer, you need to realize the story is really king. And this was a completely opposite thing because there were so many things I was missing factually uh, that I had not enough research. And so literally any morsel of something I could find made its way into the book. <laughs> so there was <laughs> nothing awesome. that I discarded on this one. There were a number of cases where there were um, conflicting records. For example, uh, Emma was injured quite badly in a car accident in 1910. Um, it's what put her in a wheelchair. It's what made them hire nurses to take care of her, both named Emma. Her husband ends up having affairs with both the nurses. So this car accident is actually quite pivotal. But there were his conflicting records. I found records that it, it had happened in Germany and records that it had happened in Texas. And there were several times throughout the book I ran into these inconsistencies. So I did have to just make choices. Um, let me ask you about what you like to read. Like, do you also read historical fiction or do you read other genres? Like, like what do you read in your spare time? I, I love historical fiction. Here's the really funny thing. So this is my first book, The Memory of Us. And when I wrote The Memory of Us, uh, I didn't even think about it being historical or historical fiction. The, the nature of what I was writing about, which is it's inspired by the song Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles. So that put me in a very specific time period. And that's the book I wrote. And it's literally not until after the fact that I realized that historical fiction as a term was even a genre. Because people always said, what makes you want to write historical fiction? I thought, I just set out to write a book. It happened to end up being historical. <laughs> But then as I looked back on all my reading habits through all the many years, I realized how much historical fiction was in there. Funny enough, though, when I'm in the writing zone, I can't read it. Um, so I do something radically different. I'll read a lot of suspense when I'm writing. Ah. I have to just put my mind in a totally different place. But then when I have writer's block, I pick up historical fiction again, because then it oh. just gets that, just unblocks it right there. Oh, my favorite living author is Kate Morton. I just think she's fantastic. She has five books out, and uh, my favorite of hers is The Secret Keeper. Um, most of them take place in England, and they are just rich with words and language and story. So I love hers. I've read almost everything Ken Follett has ever written. He can just suck you into a story like nobody's business. So they're a couple of my favorites. 
like any tips you would give aspiring writers, people who are earlier in their career, like things you've learned along the way that you're like, gosh, I wish I could tell past Camille this 10 years ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, a couple of things. The first thing is that I, I always, always say this one to aspiring writers is to not judge your draft in, in comparison to a final book that you may love, because your draft is not only going through, going to go through many of your own drafts, but then if you get an agent, it's going to go through your agent, your acquiring editor, your developmental editor, three edits with that one, copy editor, proofreader, and maybe some other hands along the way. So by the time you're reading a finished published book, there have been a lot of eyes on that book. So don't look at that and then feel like your draft is crummy because you know what, all of my first drafts are crummy and the only person I will let see them is my editor <laughs> because I don't feel like they're ready and and that's just what it is it's not ready but you just keep going with it you seek out people who will give you you know correct uh, constructive criticism not just pat you on the back and tell you you're wonderful because that's nice but it doesn't really help but that's the main thing is don't make these comparisons you know because you'll be tempted to check it and then the other thing is be a reader first um, I have no writing education and I, I'm just a voracious reader last year I read 110 books and uh, just read all through growing up and adulthood and uh, be authentic be an authentic reader on social media so there's a lot of great book parlors on Facebook, there's books, bookstagram, be there as a reader. And then someday you'll have this community when you have a book, you'll have this community that's so ready to welcome you and celebrate your launch. But don't just jump in as soon as you're a writer. Say, I have this book and I'm putting it in the world. Be, be a reader, join a community, be authentic there and it will grow naturally. And talking of that, um, you have an awesome Instagram account. I love how you share the insight of both things you're reading and also the writer life and your own books with First Emma's right there. Um, Camille DeMaio underscore author on Instagram. And you've also got some great videos on YouTube that you can get to from your website too, I noticed. I, I thought they, they were pretty fascinating. Um, I would encourage folks to connect with you and um, it's been wonderful to have you here today. Thank you for making the time.